I'm Luca and I'm in the sixth grade. I got vaccinated because I wanted to keep myself safe and to keep other people safe. When I went to go get the shot, it was, at first, I was actually a little nervous, but I would say to the people who are nervous to get the shot is just, when you get it, just don't look at it. And then it doesn't even look that much, so. When you get the shot, there's a big bubble in your arm. That's just the medicine. I want things to go back to normal because I, so I can do things with my friends. I would recommend it just for my reason to keep you safe and other people safe. Good evening. My name is Ria Apodaca, and I'm the Director of Health Programs for the Pasadena Unified School District. Pasadena Unified has been working diligently to keep our students, staff, and families safe and healthy throughout the pandemic. And tonight is another example of this work. I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining our virtual panel discussion. Our goal tonight is to answer as many questions as we possibly can about the COVID-19 vaccine which has recently received emergency use authorization from the Center for Disease Control for five to 11 year old children. If you would like to view this presentation in Spanish, please go to gopusd.com backslash town hall Spanish. We have a panel of medical experts here tonight to provide information for parents and guardians regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. I would like to thank all of the parents and guardians who submitted questions for our panel. The questions we do not address tonight will be incorporated into our Pasadena Unified Frequently Asked Questions website. We will first hear a presentation from our panelists, and then we will move into the question portion of our discussion. Please allow me to introduce our panelists to you. Dr. Ying Go. Director and Health Officer of the Pasadena Public Health Department, a board certified pediatrician and a parent. Dr. John Rodarte, General Pediatrician with Descanso Pediatrics of Huntington Health Physicians, past Chairman of Pediatrics at Huntington Hospital, and our current Medical Director for Pasadena Unified, as well as a father of two PUSD students. Dr. Shannon Tyne, Chief of Pediatrics of the Olive View UCLA Medical Center, Director of Pediatrics of LA County Department of Health Services, Professor of Pediatrics of the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, and a Pasadena mom of two vaccinated teens. And our moderator, Ms. Liliana Coronado, parent, San Rafael Elementary, and PTA board member. And now we will hear from Dr. Go. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, we have some really important information that we hope will be helpful to you that we'd like to share. But most of all, first of all, we wanna share our excitement for um, the announcement that we now have safe and effective vaccine approved for children ages five to 11. The excitement is palpable in our hallways, in our clinics, when uh, we are having families come for their vaccinations. And um, in the United States, 1.7 million young children have already gotten their first doses. So the good news is that this Pfizer vaccine has been found to be 91% effective in clinical trials. And I have an image here to show that the formulation is different for the younger children. It's the orange cap, and that helps with making sure that they get the right vaccine and the right formulation. They would receive two doses, 21 days apart, and the amount of the vaccine is one third of the dose for those who are 12 and older. The kinds of side effects that you know, the children um, would experience are similar to those in, in adults and the 12 to 17 year olds, and actually occurred less frequently than for the 12 to 17 year olds. Those side effects are most commonly injection site pain, um, fatigue, and some headache, and typically resolve in one to three days. 
and does not happen for everyone. Um, most children reported did not report those side effects. After the FDA authorized the vaccine for children 5 to 11, this, a CDC advisory committee of experts, 15 independent, non-industry, external experts from the fields of pediatrics, internal medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, neonatology, infectious diseases, et cetera, all carefully reviewed and followed a rigorous framework for evaluating the evidence to, to make a recommendation that it is safe and effective for children ages 5 to 11 in the U.S. to be vaccinated against COVID-19 and to do so as soon as possible. And Dr. Rochelle Walensky, an infectious disease specialist formerly at the Massachusetts General Hospital, a mom, and now director of the CDC, endorsed this recommendation. So we want to talk about your um, considerations as you think about the well-being of your family and your children. Uh, why vaccinate? Why are COVID-19 vaccines the best tool to protect children five and older? And I wanted to uh, remind ourselves that we um, have to make these decisions every day. And when there are adverse outcomes, illness, injury, harm that is preventable for our children, we make choices to protect them, whether it's putting them in a car seat or using a seatbelt, putting on a bike helmet, uh, giving swimming lessons or using protection like a, a fence around a pool. These are all um, steps that we take and that as a so society we value because we believe our kids deserve to be safe. And the choice we're faced with now is whether to choose vaccine protection or to choose to have them remain susceptible to COVID-19, especially as we allow them and encourage them to engage in more and more activities that could, where they could be exposed, like school, sports, and all the social activities that are essential for their, their well-being, especially with holidays just around the corner um, and gatherings with family and friends. In addition, we also value their health and protection against many uh, infectious diseases for which we vaccinate. And those include uh, whooping cough, which is pertussis, uh, flu, mumps, and meningitis, hep A, and measles. And these illnesses, occur at a lower rate among children and cause fewer deaths than COVID-19. And so we really do feel that children deserve this protection against COVID-19. So why should children and teens get vaccinated for COVID-19? Because they, even though they are at lower risk than adults for becoming severely ill, children can be infected with the virus that causes COVID-19. In fact, they are, um, they, in fact, they are infected at the same rate or higher than adults. They get, can get very sick from COVID-19. They can have both short and long-term health complications, and they can spread COVID-19 to others. So we do have evidence that children are infected uh, at the same rate or more than adults. Currently, um, in the past two weeks, children made up 24% uh, and then 27% of all total cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. And that has increased significantly because what we are seeing is that most cases are occurring in people who are unvaccinated, including our children. And that is why, um, you know, we would expect that percentage to go up because uh, unvaccinated people are the ones who are getting infected the most. And I have data here from Pasadena to help give some context about um, what we are seeing as far as cases in our community. You can see here on this graph that along the horizontal x-axis is the date or time, and uh, along the y or vertical axis is the number of cases. And over this big mountain in the middle, it was what we experienced over the summer with the Delta surge. And as you proceed along to today's date, you can see that um, at no point after the summer did we go down as low as where we were in June, where in Pasadena we were seeing zero to one cases per day. In fact, um, we hit a low in the, about the middle of October, you can see here, where um, we were still seeing about eight to 10 cases per day. And then after the activities of school starting and more sports happening and um, more uh, gatherings from Halloween, et cetera, we have seen an increase in cases in our community. Now, um, we, I cannot predict where we will go, but we do think that um, 
with these little ups and downs that we are likely, given the Thanksgiving that's happening next week and then Christmas, um, we may be in a situation where we will continue to see some increases through the winter. And this curve is to show you that the blue line, which is the number of cases that occur among vac unvaccinated people, compared to the orange line, which is the number of cases that have occurred among vaccinated people, the rate of infection among un unvaccinated people, including our children, is seven times greater than the rate of infection in Pasadena among vaccinated individuals. So we really want to move the, um, those children who are currently susceptible to getting infected into the group that is less at risk by getting vaccinated. So children ages five to 11 years are at risk for severe illness from COVID-19. Uh, even though the number, our numbers are fairly low and it is, um, they are less, at less risk than adults, we have seen in the United States more than 8,300 hospitalizations in this age group. And many of these children uh, do not have underlying health conditions or pre-existing medical conditions. Some of them do, but many of them do not. Approximately one third of the hospitalized children in this age group require admission to the intensive care unit. There have been 94 deaths in this age group out of 895 total pediatric deaths and COVID-19 is now one of the top 10 causes of death for this age group. And what's so important to know about this is that it's now preventable with a safe and effective vaccine. And so when we have preventable deaths, we really try to um, make that um, protect our children from this, this risk. Uh, Multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, we'll talk a little bit more about, um, ha is most frequent among children ages five to 11 years. And, um, and also we have seen long haul syndrome or post COVID conditions in children. So MISC, it's a delayed immune response related to COVID-19. You can see it as many as six weeks after um, a, a mild infection or a severe infection or even an asymptomatic infection. And these are um, some of the symptoms that a child might experience as a result of MISC. And when this happens, this child has to go to the hospital and go to the emergency room to get treatment. You can see here on this graph that the percent of among children who get MISC, it occurs most frequently in the age group of children ages five to 11, um, more than 40%. And then post COVID conditions do occur in children. They do occur less commonly than adults um, based on what we've observed so far. But the symptoms that they get are similar to adults, including fatigue, headache, trouble concentrating, trouble sleeping, muscle and joint pain and cough. And it really negatively impacts the quality of life. And I think about this for my teenager and how much trouble we have getting her out of the bed in the morning. And the last thing we need as she is accelerating in her academics and you know having um, more demands academically um, is to have these symptoms that are avoidable if you're protected with a vaccine. I wanted to share this story because I thought it was very illustrative. This was in the New York Times um, and it's about Kim Cobb who hopes that her family's COVID ordeals will show others the benefits of vaccinating all el eligible family members. She, her husband and her two older daughters, 14 and 12, got vaccinated quickly. But in August, her unvaccinated 10-year-old twins came down with COVID. Soon after, Dr. Cobb, a climate scientist at Georgia Tech, and her husband tested positive for breakthrough infections. Their two vaccinated children remained healthy. The parents became miserably ill, but did not require hospitalization, which they believe is because they were vaccinated. All recovered, but Dr. Cobb and one twin have lingering respiratory distress. We're in the third month post-infection and we have to see pulmonologists. We have inhalers, we're on medication and we're still having breathing difficulties, Dr. Cobb said. And this is not a kid who ever had respiratory symptoms. It was not foreseeable. If you could avoid it, you would. So there are a couple more reasons why vaccination can be so beneficial to kids. Vaccinated students stay in school and they stay in sports. They do not need to quarantine after exposure to COVID-19 if they remain asymptomatic and wear a mask. They should test on day five or later and isolate if they test positive. 
but there's an, there's um, there may be an opportunity here to also reduce masking requirements in fully vaccinated settings that we are discussing if we see case rates go down some more, uh, because the risk to these kids and families will just be lower if everyone is vaccinated. Therapies that some folks, um, some adults are thinking that they would be able to access if they get COVID themselves are not approved for children. So that would be like the monoclonal antibody or any of these new antiviral drugs. There's no research or evidence of safety or efficacy among children. And so for people who think that if they get COVID, they, they'll just go to the hospital and get some treatments, that's not the case. It's not available to children. Um, young school-age children can and do transmit COVID-19 in both home, their homes and their school settings. We have um, looked at over 13,600 cases of Pasadena residents who have gotten COVID so far, and, um, and we have seen many children bring and transmit uh, COVID-19 to their family members and other places where they go. And now many indoor businesses are requiring proof of vaccination and the state of California has an order to require um, California school children to be fully vaccinated at a certain timeline that will be set by the state. We know that there are a lot of negative impacts besides physical health on children from the pandemic and getting more kids vaccinated, more people vaccinated will help uh, to remove these negative impacts. One of these, unfortunately and tragically, is orphanhood. One U.S. child loses a parent or caregiver for every four COVID-19 associated deaths, and more than 140,000 children under age 18 lost a parent or a grandparent or caregiver who provided the child's home and basic needs, love and security and daily care. That's just something that is so tragic and can be avoided. This photo on the right is uh, from a Memorial Art Institute installation in Washington, D.C. My friend was visiting for a meeting and took this picture. And each white flag represents uh, an American that we lost to COVID-19. And some of these flags had handwritten notes from their loved ones. I wanted to address one of the risks about um, that we have seen in um, COVID-19 vaccine administered to 12 to 17 year olds that you might be wondering about because it's something that has been observed very rarely um, so among five to 11 year olds, um, then this is myocarditis. That is an inflammation of the heart that typically happens from a viral infection or from um, a toxin that a child might be exposed to. And this graph shows that the trend and the background rate of myocarditis in this age group of children from five to 11 is much, much lower than that that is naturally observed among 12 to 17 year olds. And so we think for these two reasons, first that the dose for um, this age group is one third of the dose for the 12, to 12 and older um, individuals, and because um, myocarditis just doesn't happen as much in this age group, that we don't think that uh, this will be as much of a, pro uh, a concern for this age group. And it is also um, the benefits, even for the older age group of COVID-19 vaccination far outweigh the risks of myocarditis, as you can see, for people who get COVID-19, they have a 16 times higher, higher risk of getting myocarditis than if COVID-19 infection is prevented. And so it's clear that um, even with myocarditis risk, it is much, much better to get vaccinated. And so along that line, um, we want to share this information that says, that shows that of uh, 12 to 18 year olds who have been hospitalized, with COVID-19, 97% of them were unvaccinated. And for adults, that's um, even a, a larger percentage um, of the hospitalized adults were unvaccinated. So we, we hope that if you have someone, a uh, child in this age group, that you go ahead and um, afford them this protection as well. So what to do next, um, you can go to myturn.ca.gov to make an appointment if you want to um, get some more advice. You can talk to your pediatrician or your physician or your school nurse to answer your questions. There are vaccine appointments available in a variety of settings. Some, some uh, pediatricians are offering them. Most retail pharmacies have them. Uh, we are having school clinics at PUSD schools and um, the Pasadena Public Health Department has a clinic schedule as well. And then we recommend that you prepare your child depending on um, the age of your child in an appropriate, developmentally appropriate manner to talk about why vaccine is important, 
and how um, they they should feel really great about after getting the, they're fully vaccinated about the protection that they will get. This is our website. You can go onto the Pasadena Public Health Department website and we update all the different uh, vaccine uh, venues and options for you in our city. And then I wanted to mention Thanksgiving and how to have a happy and healthy holiday. Um, this is a graphic that I think really summarizes the different layers of risk mitigation that we recommend that you take as you um, think about the festivities that you will be um, engaging with, uh, engaging in soon. So number one, of course, is get vaccinated and the rest, you know, wear a mask when you, when you're in close proximity with others, especially if you are um, getting together with people who, for whom you do not know their vaccination status, wash your hands, outdoors is better than indoors. Um, talk with your family members or your friends that you're gathering with to make sure everyone's on the same page about what your expectations are about COVID safety. And if you're traveling, we do recommend that you get tested before you travel and about three to five days after you're back before you go back to school so that you can keep everyone around, or, around you safe and also get um, care for COVID-19 if, if you are infected. Testing in our community is easy and free. If you go to our website and click on this green COVID-19 testing button, we have a long list of different places where you can get tested. The top two are free and, um, and available to everyone at CHAPCARE. There is a state-run site for PCRs, PCR testing that has been coming back in within 24 hours and it is available Monday through Sunday, so every day of the week. So we encourage you to go online schedule an appointment there. And then there are some locations that don't require appointments and PUSD of course is offering testing to families as well. These are just some of the smiles, even behind a mask, I think you can see um, a smile of the children and, and parents and family members who um, have been um, getting vaccinated at our clinics. And we really, really thank you for contributing to the health and safety of our community by being fully vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Go. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Ridarte. Thank you. I'm excited to be here tonight. And Dr. Go, thank you for that presentation. Wonderful information. Uh, I really hope that kind of helps alleviate, at least give people some background information. It's really uh, important information for them to know. Uh, I predominantly work in the outpatient setting, uh, private practice pediatrics. And I will say in my own office, uh, I really do see parents both excited to be able to get their children protected against COVID but at the same time, kind of a mixed picture, some nervousness. Uh, a lot of people are you know, somewhat worried you know, about the safety. Is, is it okay for my child to get this? Uh, how do we know what the side effects are really gonna be? Um, has it been around long enough? Uh, they hear a lot of these false claims, like things like, oh, it's gonna affect fertility, things like that. So I get the concerns, you know, as a parent myself and a parent of two children who've been vaccinated as well, uh, I understand those concerns as a parent. We always wanna do what, what's best for our kids. Uh, but I would say one thing to beware of where you get your information. I kind of liken it to uh, going to a new restaurant, one of our new great new restaurants in Pasadena. When you go there, uh, do you ask a lawyer or politician or actor who's never been to the restaurant, what should I order? Um, no, you go to the source, the waiter or the waitress, right? That's who you want to know, the people who are in the trenches working there. Uh, so it's the same way. You hopefully have a relationship with your own pediatrician. Speak to your pediatrician. They've been taking care of your child for years, and uh, that's the, really the source to go to to get the proper information and find out about this. Hopefully tonight, uh, we can also uh, be a part of that as well for you to give you more information, things like the presentation we just had, in addition to answering questions as well. Um, and I think we can't underestimate really not only what this vaccine can do for children's health care, but also their mental health care. Uh, I've really seen over the past year when we, when kids were kind of isolated, um, not only the difficulty of being isolated, but now even going back to school. I have a whole new level of stress from kids who are going back to school for the first time and feeling uncomfortable and worried. And can I be here safely? And gee, half my class is out because they're unvaccinated and someone came out positive. Um, you know, there are things like that that go on that I think we can't underestimate what it means to children to be able to get vaccinated. Some of them I see such a relief, we're like, oh, I got my shot today, thank God, you know. Um, so I'd leave you with that, and um, I said hopefully we can answer more questions tonight and uh, get you feeling comfortable with uh, what's out there to protect your children. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Rodarte. And now we'll hear from our third um, medical expert, Dr. Tyne. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shannon Tyne. I'm a pediatrician by day and a soccer mom by night and weekend. Um, I work in a more public health setting, but I also work for UCLA. My clinical practice is at all of you UCLA Medical Center out in Silmar. And one of the things that's been really remarkable for me about this pandemic is that the pediatricians have been able to engage in the pandemic from the very beginning because what we do is vaccines. And when everybody freaked out about getting the vaccine when it first came out for healthcare workers and high-risk adults, the pediatricians ended up giving a lot of the vaccines. Um, so I've personally been involved from day one of vaccines in LA County, and I've probably personally given over a thousand vaccines. Um, and I've been so honored to be a part of the response, and in particular in Pasadena, as a Pasadena mom, and as somebody who was able to get my own parents who also live in Pasadena vaccinated um, through the channels with Pasadena Public Health, I've been really proud to be a part of it. So proud, in fact, that I became a volunteer for the Pasadena Public Health. And um, last week was able to be there on the first day that kids got vaccines in the 5 to 11 age group. And they were running up with their arms up. And I came up with some tricks to help them feel better. Um, and most every kid was more mature than some of the adults I took care of in the early days. And it's, it's just been really wonderful to see the response. And I'm, I'm really encouraged by this. And I also want to echo what, what Dr. Rodarte said, is that it's so important to recognize what we gain by participating in vaccines. I have two high-level soccer players who missed months and months of soccer. I have a son who missed his eighth grade graduation. And those things may not be terrible in the grand scheme of all the people that we've lost, but for my children, those are the most important things in their lives. And so when you miss soccer or you miss your eighth grade graduation or you can't go to a party or you can't see your friends, those are the most important things for our kids. And so for me, what's really important about this moment is being able to give our kids back the things that they missed last year. They, we're not gonna take away the anxiety they had. We're not gonna take away what they lost, but we can help move them forward. And I'm so excited to be able to do that, even as I understand what it's like for many parents to have the fears about the vaccine, to wanna have their questions answered. And I can't answer every question, but I can tell you that from my training and my participation with others who have learned about the vaccine, I feel safe, I feel confident in giving it, and I want to answer questions and meet my patients and their families where they are and hopefully help them get ready and put up that arm, get that vaccine, get that booster, and really know that this is the best we can do to keep our kids in school, our kids safe, keep their grandparents and their neighbors and their teachers safe, and get us back to where we want to be, which is everybody out there in it and enjoying life again. Thank you, Dr. Tyne. And now I'll introduce our moderator, Ms. Eliana Coronado, and um, allow her a chance to introduce herself and then lead us into the question and answer portion of tonight. Thank you, Rhea, and good evening, everybody. Big thank you to our panelists, uh, Dr. Go, Dr. Rodarte, and Dr. Tyne. Really appreciate this really important information that all of us parents are uh, seeking at this point. We have uh, some really great questions that were submitted by parents in the district, and I'm just going to uh, take the time to uh, direct some of those questions to our panel and um, hopefully get some of them, as many answered as we can in the time that we have. Um, so let me start with uh, a question that came in, and I'll direct this to Dr. Tyne. Um, before I consent, the question is, before I consent to have my child vaccinated for COVID-19, I prefer to wait for several more years of safety data. What are my options? Well, I think we would all prefer to wait as long as we could to know about safety and to know about effectiveness of vaccines. And I think 
we are unfortunately in a place where we don't have the time to wait. And we have certainly seen in states where vaccination uptake has been less robust, we've seen much higher incidence of, of disease and much slower return to um, a, the new normal. Um, so the way I approach this is I honor people's concerns and try to provide as much information as possible and then remind them that even though we don't know everything, we know a lot. We've given millions and millions of vaccines to adults and more than, I mean, in the first week, I think more than 14 million kids got, I mean, we've given many, many vaccines and we've seen very few adverse events or, or adverse outcomes or any of any kind. And one of the things that I, I read on a CDC website and we talked about in conferences that your risk of anything bad happening from the vaccine is at least five times less than the risk of anything bad happening if you get any kind of COVID, even asymptomatic COVID. And so the things that I talk to people about are the things that Dr. Go gave in her presentation, which were things like transmitting it to others in your family or community who may be at higher risk, having long COVID. Um, and I have several patients. I have one patient actually who could not even get out of bed to go to Zoom school because his symptoms from long COVID were so profound that he basically laid in bed for three months. And this was a kid that was in a band, played a musical instrument, and was active in sports and had zero health conditions. And so I think about long COVID, I think about grandparents, and I think about what it's like to be scared, and I try to help people balance and, and feel comfortable knowing that even if we don't know everything, we know enough. Thank you, Dr. Tyne. Um, anything to add, Dr. Rodarte? Uh, no, I, mean, I, I echo the same opinions there. You know, I think, um, you know, we, we really have to realize that um, you know, vaccines in general have been around a long time. And as mentioned, you know, vaccine, we know what vaccines do. We know how they work. And we know that if you're going to have an adverse effect, it generally is in the first several weeks, three to six weeks. Um, so in terms of really wondering what the long-term effects, you, you just don't see those with vaccinations. And we've had vaccinations for millennia, you know, it seems like, you know, from polio to measles to chickenpox now. Um, and so we know they're not a long-term risk factor. It's the short term if you have side effects. So I don't think we really need to truly worry about the long-term effects. Thank you. What about um, you, Dr. Go? Anything that you want to just add? I know you talked about it in your great presentation, but we... yeah, I'll just yeah. say that um, you know, the the that these the immunity that we get from vaccination is very natural. I wanted to address you know that getting an infection from a virus that stays in your body for at least 10 days, sometimes much longer, is is less, is not something that we want because we get all these negative effects. We get sick and then we hang, have these negative effects. Whereas with a vaccine, the mRNA vaccine is a small strand of mRNA. We have lots of mRNA in our body all the time and it quickly degrades and gets, um, gets processed by our body within hours to days and is completely gone. And a lot of people I find don't know this. And then what happens is a natural immune response from our body to just that one little strand, as opposed to all those foreign proteins that you would get from the COVID virus that stay in your body for a long time. So I think that's for some parents that helps them to understand how, how natural the, the vaccine is in terms of um, giving you that, that um, uh, immunity without all the negative effects of getting sick from the virus. Thank you for that. And that leads right into another question, a related question uh, from a parent. And I should say, I'm, I, I'm a parent at San Rafael, as Ria said, I have a five and eight year old. So this is right exactly the questions that I'm worried about as well. Um, the question uh, that I wanted to go to next, and I'll start uh, this time with um, Dr. Wadarte, is um, if someone who recovered from COVID has documented proof of active immunity, can they be exempt from vaccinations and testing? Is it safer and more cost-effective to perform antibody testing on children? Yeah, so twofold with that. I think, first of all, we know that, or what we don't know is that what the actual amount of antibody levels are to provide adequate protection. 
Uh, so that's something that we're still trying to learn and, and it's gonna take time to learn that. So uh, certainly we've seen people who have had COVID infection and they get reinfected. Um, so it's you can't say offhand, you know, just because I have antibodies. And then I know another issue that's come up with actually the antibody testing is that I believe some of these antibody testing aren't necessarily even specific for COVID-19. There are other coronaviruses that will give you antibodies as well. And so we can't say that, do you have antibodies to COVID-19 or to another coronavirus? So there's a number of issues that come up with antibody levels and knowing are you truly um, protected or not. Uh, and then the second part of that, remind me the second part of the question was, um, oh, getting, at, getting uh, what was it, drawing levels or? The, is it safer and more cost effective to do the antibody testing? Yeah, it's certainly not more cost effective. Uh, and one, anybody who's taken your child to a laboratory <laughs> knows that's not fun either. Uh, trying to draw blood uh, to find out that and sending all those antibody levels on everybody, uh, running lab tests like that, it's actually much more costly than just getting a vaccine. Uh, so it's not more cost effective and possibly more traumatic for your child as well to have to take them in to draw blood for things like that. Thank you. Anything to add, Dr. Tyne, Dr. Go? Thank you, Dr. Wardarte. Um, another question, um, again, about antibodies. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Tyne about this one. Will getting the shot wipe out my child's natural broad spectrum antibodies, um, replacing them with targeted antibodies, and in turn giving my child less effective or efficient protection against COVID? Um, what percentage of children already have antibodies? That's the question, Dr. Yeah, so this is a complex question, and I think the, the best place to start with, it, with this one is with antigens and antibodies. When your body is exposed to an antigen or a protein or, or exposed to anything, it has the potential to respond to it. So anything foreign, if you get a virus, you can make antibodies. If you um, get a vaccine, you can make antibodies. And, and what, what antibodies are is, you, is your response to something that, that it experiences. And we are exposed to tons and tons of antigens um, all the time. And in the case of COVID, we do know that when you're exposed to the vaccine, you, re you produce antibodies. We also know that when you get the disease, you produce antibodies. The antibodies in, in both cases have the potential to be protective. And as Dr. Rodarte said earlier, we don't know how much antibody you need to be above the threshold to have more problems. But what we do know is that there's no evidence that being exposed to multiple um, antigens at the same time or to being exposed to the COVID vaccine affects, or any vaccine for that matter, affects your ability to respond to other things. So that's kind of a convoluted response. But what I would say is the question was, will the shot wipe, wipe, wipe out my natural broad spectrum antibodies? And the answer is no, it won't. Um, we do know, I do know, or I suspect where this comes from is many parents have um, come to my office and said, I'm worried about exposing my child to too many vaccines at the same time because it will overwhelm them. Too many vaccines, maybe we can space out the vaccines. Probably many of you have heard of this. Um, and it's certainly something that some practices offer and we always let parents make choices about that. But what we know is actually there is no need to do that. You can give multiple vaccines on the same day. You can, and it doesn't interfere with your ability to respond to any other thing that you might um, be exposed to. So for example, if you got your flu shot um, on Monday and on Thursday you were exposed to the common cold, your body would still be able to produce antibodies to the common cold, even though your body was working on producing antibodies to the flu from your flu shot. So the same applies to COVID. Um, and I think what we want to make sure you understand is that we don't know what antibody levels you need, but we do know that when you've had the vaccine and, and the vaccine has led you to produce antibodies, your chances of having serious infection are significantly less. And so I think that's probably the best take home, which is rather than having had the disease versus having had the vaccine, the best thing we would like to do for you is prevent you from ever having the disease by giving you the vaccine. 
And then just to address the issue about 40 to 50 percent, it's definitely true that there have been several studies that looked at the background prevalence. They just drew blood on kids to see if they had antibodies. And many, many children, and in some studies, as many as 40 to 50 percent, had antibodies to, co to a coronavirus. But as Dr. Rodarfe said, we don't know whether that's a different coronavirus, COVID-19, or immunity that was in, um, incited by the, by the vaccine itself. So that it, while that evidence of antibodies is there, we're not exactly sure what that means. And so thinking about putting that in context, we would still say, given that this is a new disease, new process, the best approach would be to be vaccinated and um, that's your best chance of having antibody response. Thank you. And the next question, sort of stepping back a little more big picture, um, question is how can we, um, and let me direct this to uh, Dr. Rodarte, at least initially, how can we confidently say the vaccine is safe if we don't have long-term research? How can testing it on healthy kids as we go be safe? Uh, so I say correct to some degree, we don't have the long-term data yet. Uh, but as I mentioned previously, we do know that you know, vaccines don't tend to have a long-term complication rate. Uh, they really do when you have side effects happen in the first three to six weeks. And so we've had certainly plenty of time with this COVID vaccine to see those initial time periods to know, are there side effects that we worry about? So uh, like I said, we don't have that long-term data. That will certainly be looked at, I'm sure. Um, I don't expect there to be a whole lot different about that, really, uh, because vaccines tend to not have long-term complications. Um, and then the second part to that question, uh, well, the, the initial testing was in the study. Uh, I don't consider giving the vaccine to the kids right now testing. That has been done. Uh, it's, get, it's received the emergency approval use already. So we're not, we're no longer in the testing stage. Uh, we're monitoring as vaccines go, uh, but now we're in the actually giving the vaccine. It's not, not being tested anymore. Because this is such an important question, I just want to see if Dr. Tyne or Dr. Go want to jump in. Um, because I think that's a question that all parents have initially, like how, how safe is it? Yeah, the only thing I would add is, and, and maybe Dr. Go has something to add, but I can't think of a single vaccine of all the vaccines that we know of that has long-term poor, um, poor outcomes. As Dr. Regarte said, the vaccines, I mean, we've been using vaccines for hundreds of years, and the side effects that we see or the consequences of vaccines are always in that initial period. And we have a lot of data now on the initial period with COVID, with the COVID vaccine. And so I feel pretty confident that, well, I shouldn't say, there's no reason to believe that this vaccine would be any different than others. Um, and, there, and we do have evidence in some vaccines that it's better to get the vaccine than the disease. So some of you have heard of the shingles vaccine, for example. You're better off if you've been vaccinated for shingles than to have had chickenpox, because or, or to be vaccinated vaccinated for chickenpox than to have chickenpox, or to get the shingles vaccine than to have had it, because some of those the, the virus for chickenpox can live in your body and come back and cause shingles later. I'm not saying that that's true for COVID, but what we know in that particular case is that the vaccine is actually safer than having had the disease. In COVID, I would say what we know now is from the two years that we've had of this, it's safer to have had the vaccine than to have had COVID because of long COVID, long-term effects, et cetera. I will just add that um, the, the vaccine, although this COVID vaccine is new, we have never had this much information so quickly about the efficacy and safety of a vaccine for any other vaccine. It's a large amount of scientific information to really reassure us. And the other thing is that there had, this technology has been researched for, for two decades. So it's not like it was developed overnight because we invested so much money and had a strategy of having multiple um, companies working on the vaccine at the same time. That's how we got things so quickly. But but this um, technology has been tested in uh, cytomegalovirus vaccine and Ebola vaccine. So it's been around for 20 years. 
Thank you for that. Um, related to the study that Dr. Wardate, you mentioned, um, let me ask uh, Dr. Tyne, how many 5 to 11-year-olds were included in the four-month study on the COVID shot? How many in the study um, received the placebo? Sure, that's an easy one. I just looked that one up. <laughs> um, so there were 4,647 kids in the study in that age group, and 3,109 received the vaccine, and 1538, 1,538 received the placebo. Thank you. Um, continuing on, another question from a parent was, um, uh, let me ask Dr. Rodarte this one with any other panelists feeling free to weigh in. Um, the question is about boosters. Can you explain how many shots or boosters we can expect to give our kids? Yeah, we, you know, that's undetermined as of yet, but I think we can safely assume that it's likely that boosters will be needed, uh, much like the flu vaccine that we give every year uh, because our immunity wanes with the flu. Uh, this likely can be similar as well. And as we see certainly with COVID, with COVID virus and it's mutating in variants, it may be something that every time it's reassessed, we may add a new you know, part to that to kind of give you more immunity. So I think we don't have any data yet and information on getting the booster shot. I know we're expecting that it's going to be approved for everybody 18 and above probably this week, potentially, I just read. Um, so we can expect that for the older pe older group. Uh, but for kids, I would assume we will likely be needing some booster in the future uh, to be, you know, that's to be determined exactly when and how much. Uh, but I would expect that it's likelihood. Dr. Time? I'm ready when it's time to booster my kids. <laughs> Anything for you, Dr. Gill? No, I will add, I, I feel the same way. And I didn't mention, I do have three kids, and one of them who's eligible was fully vaccinated in the summer before she went to summer camp. And my two um, kids who are between five and 11 years old got their first shots and were, they're eagerly, eagerly awaiting their second. Thank you. A couple more questions. I think we have a little bit of time. Um, a little bit of shifting gears a little bit. Question from a parent. Um, to uh, Dr. Chai, and I'll start with you. What should parents or children say to friends who seem to be spreading misinformation? It's hard. Um, Dr. Google can be dangerous. Um, and sometimes we don't know what is information and what is misinformation. And I also know that many people have fears and concerns about the vaccine that lead them to attach to information that, that helps validate their feelings. Oh, it's not studied, therefore I'm not ready. And I'm scared. And those things are valid. And I am I absolutely approach all my patients in a way that allows them to be where they are. Some people are not ready and that is okay. And my job is to do everything I can to help you get ready. And so what I suggest that people do is that they talk to people they trust. And we have really good evidence that if somebody you trust has a positive experience, then you're more likely to have a positive experience. And that applies far beyond the COVID vaccine. That's just life. Um, in the case of the COVID vaccine, if you feel ready, go get it and tell everybody how it went for you. Tell them it hurt and you you had a headache the next day. And that's okay, because the next day you were fine. So share real and true information. And then really, I think the best thing you can do for people who are concerned about getting this information is talk to someone who has medical background and experience that you trust. One of the things we've seen where I work is that the uptake, and I'm sure Dr. Rodarte sees the same thing, is the uptake for a kid who comes into my clinic and has a checkup that day, and if I say, do you want your COVID vaccine? They're much more likely to say yes if I've had the opportunity to talk to them than they are if someone calls them up and says, hey, we have drop-in COVID vaccines, right? It's okay, I love drop-in COVID vaccines and you should definitely do that. But for people who are out there in the world trying to find the information that works for them, try to steer those people toward places where there are medical providers that they trust. 
because I think that will help encourage them to hear evidence-based scientific information and then make their decision. And if they're not ready today, maybe they'll be ready tomorrow. And you know, we all have to honor personal choice. I know there are rules about when you have to have it and when you have to go to school and we factor those in too. But really what we need to do is provide the best good information to allow people to make the decisions that are right for them. Thank you. Um, anything to add, Dr. Wardarta? I know earlier you, in your remarks, you talked about the importance of trusting your pediatrician for, for reliable information, evidence-based information. Right, yeah, no, I, I echo those thoughts that Dr. Tyne was talking about. And, you know, um, I would say one, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, loaded issue. People are very passionate, uh, either for or against sometimes. And sometimes they're very passionate about being in the middle, and that, that's okay as well. Uh, but as she mentioned, you know, speak to someone that you trust with a medical background. Uh, speak to someone that you know that uh, has done their research. And if, you know, people are pushing things on you that you're unsure about, like, wow, is that true? You know, ask for the source. We find out what, what source are you using. And, you know, be critical of, of looking at sources. Um, I, I love when my kids are learning about how to read what a, what a valid source is when they have to do a bibliography and things like that. Well, as adults, we need that we need information too. What's the valid source we're using? Where, where are people getting their information from? So, you know, be calm about it. Don't get into an argument about it. Uh, but go ahead and ask. I, I'd love to see your source. Where is that information coming from? Dr. Rico, any thoughts on this misinformation question? Please. I, I do think um, that you have to still try to approach people with compassion and it, because otherwise they won't be open to listening to you and you may not be able to change their minds. But I think you should consider if there are friends or family members who are spreading misinformation or who have chosen not to get vaccinated themselves, whether or not you want to go get together with them for Thanksgiving. And you should make informed choices about protecting your family and um, and hopefully vaccination is one of those things. And then um, make decisions about what risks you want to take and you feel comfortable with if you are around people who are unvaccinated. Thank you. And one, I think one final question. Um, we have a couple minutes. Um, I will start with Dr. Wardarta this time. Compared to other states, why are we having to deal with vaccine mandates? Yeah, I think it was actually well said by Dr. Goh's data earlier and showing that, you know, the states that have, you know, less precautions, uh, maybe less mask precautions, less vaccination status, uh, they have a higher incidence, a higher rate of COVID and also higher hospitalization rates for those that are unvaccinated. Um, so, you know, depends on, can we live in a state that, yeah, we have a lot of precautions that are being taken. Uh, and I know it's difficult. It's hard. We all want to get back to normal. We all want to do what we used to do pre-COVID. Uh, but at the same time, we're remaining safe. And we're alive to do that. We're alive to have that future, uh, to be able to do the things that we love to do. So, yeah, it might be a little hard on all of us to kind of do, oh, I have to wear a mask. Oh, I need to, they want me to get vaccinated. Uh, at the same time, we're, we're alive to have that conversation. And uh, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that you know, we are in a place where we take this seriously and that we are doing what we feel is best for the population to keep us all safe, to keep our children safe, keep our families safe, our grandparents safe. Anyone want to wait, jump in on that one before I turn it back over to Ms. Apodaca? Thank you, uh, Dr. Rodarte, Dr. Tyne, and Dr. Go, uh, for taking the time to answer all of these parent questions. I'm sure there are more questions, and whatever we didn't get to, um, uh, PUSD will be able to answer um, through a newsletter. I think Ms. Apodaca will talk more about that. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity also to participate, and I'll turn it back over to you, Ms. Apodaca. Thank you. And I actually would like to take this opportunity as well to provide Ms. Liliana the chance to share any of her thoughts that she would like to from her parents' perspective. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, this, this has been um, a really great conversation for me. Um, I can share my personal experience as a, as a parent um, when the vaccine first came out for uh, those in uh, uh, the high risk age group. It was the first to try to get my parents there. 
um, immediately uh, when I was eligible. Um, I went as soon as I could. Um, but I will say that um, thinking about when it came time very recently to think about my kids, it felt really different for some reason. And I found myself really struggling with um, that conflict. Uh, I'm a really rational person. I try to be very logical in my decision making. I'm a lawyer by training. And it just wasn't um, easy for me, even though I knew the data and I knew the research and I read upon it and I consulted with people in my family who are medical doctors. It was still something that gave me a little bit of pause. Um, but I knew that I had to trust the science and I knew that um, that it was I felt that it was safe and I felt that the risks of, of COVID were uh, were too strong in comparison to the risks associated with the vaccine. And so last week we took my husband and I took our five year old and our eight year old um, to get it to get it. Um, but I, I wanted just to share that because I think it's totally natural as a parent, um, even if you're you know, got the vaccine yourself and encouraged everybody else to be worried when it comes to your your littles. Um, and so I, I really appreciate what all of you had to share um, and the great work that you're doing in trying to, to reassure us parents um, because, you know, that's our precious cargo and I think it's natural. I really appreciated the remarks around, um, you know, meeting people where they are um, because I think that's so critical. Um, and I think more conversations like this and more access to really reliable and evidence-based information is just what we need to uh, put out in the community. So I'm so thankful that the district and the Department of Public Health um, are, is having this forum and, and, you know, consider other ways to also get this good information out as well. And again, thank you for letting me participate. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your authenticity and thoughtfulness. So the Health Programs Department of Pasadena Unified is striving to make vaccines and testing accessible to all of our students. In partnership with the Pasadena Public Health Department, Pasadena Unified has scheduled vaccination clinics for five to 11 year olds. The first three clinics are scheduled, scheduled for Monday, November 22nd, Tuesday, November 23rd, Wednesday, November 24th, next week. All of these pediatric clinics will run from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at the McKinley School Gym, which is located at 325 South Oaknell Avenue, right across the street from the PUSD Education Center. To register for an appointment, please use the website, myturn.ca.gov. If you need assistance, please email healthprograms at PUSD.us or please call the Pasadena Public Health Department Citizens Helpline at 626-744-6000. I would like to thank all of our panelists, Dr. Go, Dr. Rodarte, Dr. Tyne, and Ms. Coronado for their time and support of our community. And I would like to thank our PUSD Health Programs team the PUSD Communications and KLEARN staff for their organization and technical support of this event. Finally, thank you to all of the community members who submitted questions and to all of you who are watching this evening. Take care, be safe, and have a good night.